Are you Tofi? No, not Toffee, although that does actually sound pretty good. A T O F I, Tofi. Well, if you don't know, don't worry about it because you'll find out soon enough. And it very much explains that title why being normal weight could actually be speeding you up towards illness and a premature death. But I'd like to take it a step further because there's even instances where a person could be overweight and be healthier than a normal weight individual. Even assuming smoking, exercise, and all that jazz is the same. Don't believe me? Well, I haven't lost my mind. I'll show you. You may or may not be aware that there's an incredibly popular metric used in clinics and in research called BMI, or body mass index. That metric is extremely simple to calculate. It's merely your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. A lot of people, especially in the USA, are at least overweight, but a good amount are also obese, meaning as BMI creeps closer to 30, we're talking severely overweight. Here's the thing though, I'm overweight. And if you're thinking, what? You're overweight, how? Then first of all, thank you. And if you're thinking, yep, seems about right, then meet me in the playground at 2 p.m. after Mrs. Schuster's class. I have some choice words for you, and I've been practicing my karate, punk. Kidding aside, I have a BMI of about 27, which puts me in the overweight category, according to this BMI metric. Since it only considers weight as a whole, it's flawed because it doesn't distinguish between muscle weight and fat weight. In fact, when looking at the predictive ability of BMI to predict cardiometabolic mortality, that's a fancy way of saying that your body is strained and the risk of dying prematurely, and you compare against a metric that takes fat into account called relative fat mass, the relative fat mass measurement is more sensitive and predictive. We can see that mortality risk on the vertical axis here, so women up top, men on the bottom, and the horizontal axis is the relative fat mass measurement, with risk slowly ebbing upwards until it really takes off somewhere about 40% RFM for women and above 30% RFM for men. So, what I'm getting at here is that you can have a normal BMI, a normal weight, or less than a BMI of 25, but still be over fat. You may have actually heard of that concept before, but what I'd like to introduce you to is to take it a step further based on this study. So let me revisit this uh, first thing that I asked you. Are you TOFI? No, <laughs> not TOFI. <laughs> That stands for thin outside, fatter inside, or as some people call it, skinny fat. Some ways to tell is to calculate your BMI using a formula that I discussed earlier, and here it is again. In addition, measure your waist circumference using a tape measure. If your BMI is less than 25 and your waist circumference is larger than 88 centimeters for women or 102 centimeters for men, then you might qualify as being higher risk as a TOFI. Don't worry though, there's some simple solutions. And even so, you may still not be at risk because of this second study that we're about to go over. By the way, if you want a more in-depth checklist to determine if you fall under a higher risk based on some of the simple at-home measurements and answering a few simple questions, I offer a more in-depth checklist for free. Uh, I'll be releasing it to my email list in two days from this video's release, so be sure to join there. Or if it's past the two-day mark, and you're watching this, join my free community. Both links are in the description. It's also in the free community. Okay, so how can a person who is overweight, let's actually take it a step further, they even have more body fat than you, yet they might be healthier. How is that possible? Well, in this second study, the researchers quantified the body fat into three compartments. Visceral fat, so fat around the organs, abdominal subcutaneous fat, so fat around your midsection, just under the skin, and gluteofemoral fat, fat around your thighs and butt. Then they adjusted for BMI, meaning that they wanted to find the relationship between these fat depots, these three fat depots, independent of weight. 
We can see that here. We have two major diseases up top, the subgroups split by sex and the BMI adjusted fat depots, and then a forest plot indicating risk of each disease. If the squares move to the right, that's increased risk. And if they move to the left, that's reduced risk. So if we take a closer look, it seems clear regardless of sex, visceral fat is linked to diabetes and heart disease. Fascinatingly though, abdominal subcutaneous fat or ASAT there is either neutral or a relatively slightly increased risk of diabetes, except in women. And finally, the most surprising of all, there's a fat storage depot that reduces risk, the gluteofemoral fat or G-fat there. So this tells us a few things. One, visceral fat is harmful to health. Probably not a huge shock for those in the know. Two, not all fat is created equal. So some fat is not detrimental to health, at least not to these metrics. Although it might not be great to have excess as it will probably stress the joints as a counter. And three, conceptually, this identifies that a person who is normal weight and even normal healthy relative fat mass, the more exact measure could be in worse health situation than a person significantly more over fat than them simply because of the distribution of their fat. Now we're a few degrees removed from BMI, right? I mean, we've, we're not just assessing weight. Uh, we're not just assessing body fat through relative fat mass. We're assessing the position of the fat, even independent of weight. So that raises this question of why? Why do these fat depots diverge so strongly? And how should we think about all of this? And if you have more visceral fat, what could you do to reverse that? Well, for some of that, let's lean on this scientific review. In this review, the researchers describe the differences in these fat depots and what might explain the differences in harm. So I'll admit it, there are still some mysteries, but we do know a few things. For example, when taking tissues from all three of these fat depots, they each have different gene signatures, meaning visceral fat expresses a different set of genes compared to gluteofemoral fat. In fact, that phenomenon may be all the way from development because these fat depots may originate from different stem cells as an embryo. In fact, in fact, when growing these fat cells in the exact same metabolic environment, some of the gene signatures are still unique to that fat depot. That offers some clues, but we also have some more physiologically concrete differences. One of those is fat turnover. They mentioned that abdominal subcutaneous and likely visceral fat have faster turnover than gluteofemoral fat depots meaning that when bound by hormones like the stress hormone cortisol, the cell dumps fat molecules into ectopic sites. So meaning areas fat shouldn't normally be like muscle and the liver and other organ systems, thereby promoting insulin resistance and cardiovascular risk. In addition, these cells are more prone to undergo hypertrophy or enlarging. On the other hand, the gluteofemoral fat acts as a protective buffer, which is much slower in its release of fat molecules and having a robust capacity to take up fats from the bloodstream without releasing them back. They also retain their hyperplasia ability, meaning that the generation of new fat cells, creating more fat cells to retain fat instead of dumping into the bloodstream and to the you know, muscle and liver. So within a tissue, we're getting wildly different reactions. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, so how do we think about all this and what do we do? Before that, if you're wanting more ways to assess risk beyond the free template that I mentioned earlier, I have an extended analysis of this video that you're watching along with an accompanying article. And in it, I'm going to describe another way to assess risk from home along with the progression of risk. I'm also going to go over some more of how these fats differ, the mechanisms and a particular treatment that potently redistributes fat and leads to significant health improvements by simply moving it. If you're interested, check out the Physionic Insiders in the description box. You'll get access to all that plus so much more. You can see the list right here, all included. Again, in the description box, if you're interested. Here's how I'd think about all this. 
One, on average, being overweight or more specifically over fat is still a greater risk than being normal weight. However, that assumes that the fat distribution is about the same. If a person has less overall fat or equal amounts of fat, but they have a disproportionately greater level of visceral fat, they are likely at greater health risk, at least cardiometabolic risk. The use of TOFI, no, not TOFI, template in the email list and in the free community to give you a better overall idea of your risk if you're unsure. And number two, fat is not all the same. The location of the fat, independent of your weight, makes a tremendous difference on your risk. Number three, the review that we went over mentions that simple nutrition adjustments, like just about any diet, but calorically restricted, leads to preferentially reductions in this especially harmful visceral fat. And if you're in the normal weight category with higher visceral fat, I would strongly recommend filling in some of that weight loss with muscle by implementing a resistance training program. So you're attacking the issue from two directions. So less visceral fat and more metabolically demanding muscle tissue. In fact, I've covered an especially effective group of foods and a diet that has had an outsized impact on melting visceral fat off of your body. Check it out right here. And for those of you that are going to say, I'd pronounce it tofi and not tofi, that wouldn't work for the joke. Come on, bro, play along. I'll catch you later.